Our next speaker is Ryan Parker. He is the Grasslands Coordinating Wildlife Biologist, and he will be discussing grazing, benefiting bees, butterflies, and bovines in Arkansas. Ryan, would you like to share your screen? Definitely. Can, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right, so thanks, Leslie, first of all, for inviting me to speak at the forum today. Uh, I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to uh, giving this presentation. Um, I'm the Grasslands Coordinating Wildlife Biologist, and I actually just started my position in July here in Arkansas. Um, but I have had the opportunity to get out across the state and really get a, get a good idea of where um, our grazing is in the state right now. So I titled my uh, presentation, Native Grazing Benefits Bees, Butterflies, and Bovines in Arkansas, because I, I truly believe that it, it, it can and it does if we uh, keep moving forward in the right direction in this state. So uh, I would like to just start by kind of giving us an eagle eye view of the grazing lands here in Arkansas. Um, I grabbed this data from the Arkansas Farm Bureau report. Um, you can also find very similar numbers on um, the Ag Extension website uh, on the NRCS. Um, but really, in, in general, in a fluctuating number, there's 8.3 million acres in Arkansas that support um, livestock um, grazing um, or use for hay uh, for pasture land. And the state cattle inventory is uh, around 1.7 million head on 28,000 farms. Um, 28,000 farms it is a lot when we think about um, the benefit that even just one pasture on each of those farms could have on, on um, creating wildlife habitat, uh, particularly for monarchs and, and bees and other pollinators. Most of our grazing lands in Arkansas are um, introduced, uh, and these are some of the common pasture forages that we will see. And, and when I say most, I do mean a, a very large percentage of our grazing lands in Arkansas today. Um, they're introduced tall fescue. Uh, that's in the picture here in the upper left. Um, we also have Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, um, Caucasian blue stem, down here in the lower right, and Dallas grass. Um, tall fescue is typically found in northern Arkansas into Missouri, um, across the fescue belt where we see a lot of our Bermuda and Bahia grasses um, in south Arkansas. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that these are um, introduced grasses. And in Arkansas in particular, we're really seeing these introduced grasses planted in monocultures. Um, and there's a, a varying level of palatability and nutrition in these introduced pasture grasses, um, but it's really what the livestock industry has turned to and, and uses today um, commonly throughout the state. There's not a huge amount of wildlife benefit um, in these pasture grasses, particularly when they're monocultures. One thing that producers are doing across the state is interseeding legumes. Uh, particularly, again, introduced legumes like white clover and red clover. And uh, interseeding white clover and red clover or other introduced legumes will add some pollinator benefit. Um, but again, we need to remember that these are still introduced species. There's a couple native grasses uh, in Arkansas that are um, planted for forage. Um, Eastern gamma grass and switchgrass. And, and we really see these when they're used for forages in monocultures as well. And although they're native, um, when they're planted in monocultures, they can really take over, outcompete other, other grasses. Um, and again, we can intercede these with legumes, commonly they're white clover or red clover um, introduced. So what these systems are lacking um, is native plant diversity. And we've really had some great topics, uh, discussions about um, native plant diversity and its importance, both yesterday and today in this forum. Um, diversity in native grasses can and should be in our, our grazing lands. And, and it should also include a diverse um, suite of native forbs and legumes. And really, without that native grass component and that native forb component, uh, we're missing 
a critical habitat structure uh, for pollinating insects, for grassland birds, for small mammals. But there are some, some ways to move forward from the, uh, this and, and consider planting uh, some native forages. Um, grasses that were here historically that evolved with grazing and fire on the landscape. Um, and things that would really uh, benefit from an ecological perspective um, and benefit grazing uh, systems. Uh, big blue stem uh, is both of these pictures here on the bottom. A little blue stem in the middle here is that red looking grass. Um, Indian grass is a picture on the upper right screen. Um, these are great bunch grasses, native bunch grasses, highly palatable, highly nutritious, and, and they um, really sort of help increase that amount of bare ground by being a bunch grass that, that um, wildlife need, but they also increase cover, which is really important. Um, this picture here on the t uh, top left is Canada wild rye, and it's a cool season grass, also great wildlife value, and, and has some forage potential. Um, so again, planting uh, a diverse mix of these grasses, even eastern gamma grass and switchgrass, they are native, uh, but at, at the right concentration, uh, a diverse mix of these native grasses could really benefit wildlife and, uh, and livestock in the state. And of course, um, there's a whole bunch of native leg legumes and native forbs that we can plant. I, I put a little list here. This list doesn't even scratch the surface of what I think we could include in our native mixes. Um, but the first four that I listed here are italicized and those are legumes. Um, in the top right here, we have Illinois bundle flower. It's a great legume. It's highly palatable livestock. And the top middle picture here is white prairie clover, another legume, great uh, forage for livestock. And then we have some other species too, like landsleaf coreopsis, um, gray-headed coneflower, ashy and sawtooth sunflower, prairie blazing star, all wonderful forbs that we can include in um, a diverse grazing mix um, that would benefit pollinators. And then um, I'm glad that I threw in butterfly milkweed uh, here at the bottom of the list. It's in the bottom corner of the screen. And um, butterfly, milk, butterfly milkweed, as do other milkweeds, really do have a place in our grazing lands. And if we want to um, think ecologically about our grazing lands, benefit livestock and benefit wildlife, we really have to consider including milkweed in our mixes. So there's three mixes that I'm gonna share with you right here. They're just screenshots of these mixes, but Quail Forever um, developed these mixes uh, for grazing lands in the state of Arkansas. And you'll notice that I put a percentage here of grasses and forbs for each. They are grass heavy mixes, which I think that is important when we're working with livestock uh, particularly cattle producers in Arkansas, um, if we're going to work with them to transition portions of their property from non-native introduced forages to native forages, uh, we want to make sure that we are still providing that um, grass majority in those mixes for the livestock. The first mix here is just a basic grazing seed mix. Uh, we have a native warm season grass mix with forbs. And then the last mix here is my personal favorite, the diverse grazing seed mix. Um, it's 88% grass, 12% forbs, but it does include um, cool season grasses, which adds that extra diversity in our mixes and um, still 19 forbs and legumes in this mix. Um, it's not the 40 to 60 um, wild, wildflowers, forbs, legumes in some of our more pollinator focused mixes, but that's still a, a relatively great number uh, to include in the grazing mix for our livestock producers. This map here um, comes from an actual farm that myself and uh, one of our Quail Forever biologists along with Arkansas Game and Fish biologists is working on in the state. Uh, you can notice that there are 11 different pastures here, different sizes ranging from 18 acres all the way down to 1.9 acres. I really like that uh, this particular producer has uh, pastures of different sizes. That's incredibly important. All pastures don't need to be equal, I will argue. And, and notice that we're only focusing on transitioning one pasture 
on this property. One pasture of native warm season grasses or a diverse grazing mix with forbs will go a long way on the livestock operation. This producer um, in particular could spend a majority of the early summer into mid late summer on this pasture with proper rotation. So that's why we really um, help focus develop uh, focus developing flexible grazing management plans with our producers um, and focus on an op operation wide rotation if feasible. This particular landowner is rotating his livestock across all of these pastures and so really it's easy to to include a native pasture of, of grasses and forbs into that rotation. And then I included here prescribed fire is a critical tool. So integrating a grazing and burning rotation is important. Like Shelly mentioned, um, our grasslands are fire driven and, and what we're trying to do is transition some of these pastures into little pockets of grassland. So fire has to, has to stay in the mix and it kind of becomes an art then of figuring out when to when to burn and when to graze and how to fit that all in a rotation. And then I included a snippet out of the grazing document I was working on, but I really want to highlight this yellow box down here, be adaptive. Um, that's the key to rotational grazing, but particularly on native pastures, be adaptive um, with your stocking rate, with um, the time that you spend in a pasture. It's different for every landowner, it's different every year. And, and the key is really adaptive management and holistic management. There are many different programs in the state of Arkansas for um, transitioning non-native or introduced pasture fields into native grasses and forbs. Um, these programs will do anything from uh, cost sharing on native seed mixes, um, herbicide for, for prep, preparing a field for transitioning into natives. Um, they'll cost share on fencing, uh, watering infrastructure, which is incredibly important in a, in a grazing mix and or a grazing rotation, and, and also prescribed grazing. So, so cost share for a landowner to rotate their livestock. The first program I wanna talk about just real briefly is um, led by Arkansas Game and Fish. It's uh, the native grazing demonstration program. And, and really, if you're familiar with Acres for Wildlife in the state, just, just think Acres for Wildlife, very similar. Um, but the native grazing demonstration's goal is to help landowners transition a portion of their grazing land into native grasses and forbs. Um, there are several things that um, are provided to the landowner should they choose to um, enroll in the native grazing demonstration program. Um, there's herbicide that can help um, treat the field before uh, planting into natives. Seed mix is included. And we can also consider things like a cover crop if it's necessary or if it fits into that landowner's um, schedule. The cool thing ab about this program is that once this uh, native grass and forb mix is established, um, it's grazable. And that's where um, our flexible grazing management plan, either written by an Arkansas game and fish biologist or a quelfer ever biologist comes in. And again, I really want to highlight flexible because these grazing management plans are meant to be adaptive and, and, and even they should be written alongside a landowner. Um, I think that would be critical. Uh, a caveat is that the livestock will be weighed before and entering, before entering and after exiting uh, the native pasture and also um, a, maybe a pasture that is not being planted into natives. Um, that way we can capture uh, weight gains. Um, there's not a lot of research in Arkansas specifically showing gains on natives. So that's, that's one thing we're hoping to get out of these demonstration projects. So this, this native grazing demonstration program, it's really just to introduce native grazing to the state of Arkansas. We don't have a lot of native grazing, diverse native grazing going on here in the state. Um, and, and we really hope to create a demonstration site out of these, out of these um, projects um, to host workshops and to bring um, grazing specialists and, and other landowners, and natural resource professionals out to, um, to show them uh, it working on the ground. 
Of course, there's a couple other great programs I'm going to talk about um, real briefly. Um, one of them is, is EQIP, an NRCS Farm Bill funded program. Um, and through this program, you can apply to, to get cost share for things like fence, if it's electric fence or bar barbless wire, whatever works on your property. Uh, watering infrastructure, maybe we need to drill a well and then run some pipeline from that well to new tanks and we need to pump that water from that well through the pipeline with either an electric pump or a solar pump. Those are things that we can cost share on and that's very critical for um, a rotational grazing system on, on a diverse native mix. Um, Equip uh, can also cost share on, on the mix itself through forage and biomass planning. That's where we where we um, develop our native grass and Ford mix and, and we can provide cost share on that as well as prescribed grazing. Um, I think that um, including prescribed grazing in a cost share application is great. It gives that landowner that extra cushion um, to rotate their cattle and um, it really is a beneficial thing. And then we have CSP. Um, CSP can also be an excellent program for livestock producers across the state of Arkansas, particularly those that are interested in, in grazing uh, diverse native mixes. Um, there are several enhancements, and I uh, just selected three here, three that make sense, but there's a whole list of CSP enhancements. Um, grazing management for improving quantity, quality of wildlife habitat, improve grazing management for enhanced plant structure, composition for wildlife, or establishing native grass or legume and forage base to improve plant community. These are just three enhancements of a whole list of CSP enhancements that, that can benefit a, a diverse native forage mix um, for our livestock producers in the state. And this little map here in the corner uh, comes from another property that we are working on. It's just a really great example of um, one big pasture, which is outlined in the yellow, and then uh, we've cost shared on it to to split it into eight smaller pastures um, with fence. And particularly, what I like about this this project is those pastures are not the same size. We have smaller pastures and we have larger pastures. We've divided that into eight, and there's water and and pipeline and the infrastructure there to to facilitate rotational grazing. There is not a lot of research in the state of Arkansas yet for native grazing in particular, um, but there is some great research in surrounding states. And so I just wanted to, to provide this page to you guys uh, today uh, and point you in the direction of one resource that, that has been really useful for me and others in the state, and that's the Center for Native Grasslands Management, the University of Tennessee. They have some excellent resources on that um, website. Uh, publications, scientific peer-reviewed publications, um, and they even have um, helpful guides here. I, I took a screenshot of three of the more helpful guides that I like. Um, they're all focused on uh, grazing and growing uh, native warm season grasses in the Mid-South. Um, I took a screenshot of this particular graph here that, that really shows um, the benefit that native warm season grasses can have and, and sort of the economic benefit they have over things like Bermuda grass or, or a, um, sorghum mix. So I, I will just wrap up by um, saying that here in the state of Arkansas, I, I really think it will be important moving forward for us to encourage um, diverse native grazing. Um, and, and that may include a grass heavy mix with Forbes um, I think the forbs are critical. Um, livestock can and will eat forbs, um, but, but they need to be grazed right through rotational grazing plans so that those forbs are, are providing the um, habitat that is necessary for, for pollinating insects and for, and for grassland birds. Um, and, and at the same time, a diverse native grazing mix does produce high quality forage, both through the bunch grasses and through the for, forbs and legumes for livestock. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to add that um, it is not as hard um, as you would think to incorporate this into an operation-wide grazing rotation. And, and I really do see an avenue for, for more of that in the state. And uh, with that, I will uh, take any questions that you may have. Awesome, thank you so much, Ryan.
I'll give everyone a few minutes to enter in any questions into the chat box. Um, and if you're joining us on Facebook Live, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Hold on, sorry, my chat box just disappeared. So, first question, Ryan, how do you rotate cattle on the native field in the summer? Um, do you rotate onto the other paddocks with introduced forages or just rotate with hot wire within the native paddock in the summer months? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it all depends on the size and the stocking rate. Um, how many how many cattle are you working with? How big is your herd? And, and how many acres is the field of natives? Um, in that example that I showed with 11 other pastures, that landowner will likely be uh, rotating out of um, that native planted field, uh, maybe mid-June, maybe he'll enter in, in April and, and rotate out in June. And, and he will have a number of other pastures to move to until um, those native grasses have, have bounced back, maybe two, maybe three weeks of rest until those native grasses are back and, and he can rotate back in. Um, in, in a larger pasture, uh, yeah, you could certainly run electric fence and, and rotate uh, throughout several smaller um, native planted pastures. Awesome, thank you. Do you have any recommendations for drill planting, spreader planting, or other methods? You know, I, I really think um, it's important if we're going to, to plant with a drill, it's a no-till drill. Um, you have to be careful because um, you can get too deep even with our native grasses. Um, you, want, you want soil to seed contact, but you don't want to get that seed too deep. So make sure you calibrate your drill to to go a quarter inch or, or less under the soil. Um, I, I also think that um, native seed mixes can be broadcasted on, on top. Another question, Ryan, is rotational grazing an absolute necessity? Can you do a light to moderate season long grazing on these areas with proper stocking rates? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that you can. Um, again, it just kind of comes back to uh, what's going to work best for the landowner and, 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 how, and what is that stocking rate? How many livestock are you, are you working with? Um, again, a light to moderate uh, stocking rate. Um, you could spend more time in a pasture and, and maybe that's um, all summer long. Um, you have to be careful when you um, have too high of a stocking rate. You'll it's, it's really all about um, holistic management. So just watching that field. And if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel like you need to, to pull those livestock out, then pull them out. Um, but what I will say is that, that native grasses can be grazed relatively hard. Um, they can be grazed down less than four inches, maybe three or even two inches. And that, that's a scary thing to think about, but, but they can take that. It's all about the rest that they have afterwards. Um, so if you graze your native grasses down that, that far, um, be sure to provide them an adequate uh, amount of rest. And, and another thing you have to be careful with a low, too low of a stocking rate is that um, native grasses can become stimmy. Um, and, and so they're less desirable. I wouldn't say less palatable, but maybe less desirable to forage on if you're a cow when they become stimmy. They really like that soft leaf material. Um, so, so it's really all about uh, uh, the correct stocking rate. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Um, so we did have a question and I answered in the chat box, but just for the recording's sake, uh, the, everyone will have access to these recordings. They will be posted on um, the Arkansas Monarch Conservation Partnership YouTube page. Um, there's actually already a recording on Facebook Live um, this is a live session and you can go back there and view it, but those recordings will be posted and I can email out the recordings to the list of attendees as well. And they'll be um, broken up into individual talks so you don't have to skip through a, a four hour long session. 